I want to thank uh, Paul and Megan for inviting me uh, to speak here. I've been out of the Pompano Loop about 10 years. I currently work with shellfish, so I've transitioned from one of the most spastic aquatic creatures out there to one of the most, well, I wouldn't say boring, it's, but that's been my transition. But uh, hopefully I'll inform you of uh, the current status of uh, Pompano mariculture in the U.S. and abroad, <clears throat> Florida Pompano, that is. So Florida Pompano, it's a tropical, subtropical uh, jack species, uh, pretty much limited commercial landings uh, over the years. However, it's highly esteemed, has a very high market value, if not one of the highest market values um, in the U.S. for marine uh, fin fish. <clears throat> this is a phrase that uh, Mark Twain came up with, is basically described Pompano as delicious as the less criminal forms of sin. I really don't know what that means exactly, but it, it sounds good as a marketing tool, I guess. But they're very high value, that's the bottom line here. Uh, they're, again, they're very, uh, they're sought after in the southeastern United States, also, also the Gulf of Mexico. They're very popular recreationally uh, salt species and again very high market value. So I don't know if people are aware but one of the most famous pompano dishes was created here in New Orleans is pompano and papillote or pompano and parchment paper. Uh, chefs continue to explore different options with this fish and as, as such it's, it's driven this market price quite high. And because of this and because of the limited commercial catch interest developed in pompano aquaculture considerably several decades ago. Back in the 50s, and, I, and when, I call, when I talk about this, I call this uh, the phase one of research and development for Florida Pompano. So there's a lot of pond-based studies. We started in Florida back in the 50s. There were some commercial production operations started uh, back in the early 60s that, that lasted until the mid-1970s or so. There was cage research done in Florida, Alabama, and Texas. Reproduction larva culture research was conducted in Florida in the 70s. Frank Hoff led this effort and came up with a lot of uh, groundbreaking um, <clears throat> techniques that we could spawn this uh, species in captivity. Some pond-based research, cage research in Venezuela, and then there's a com commercial operation that started in Florida in 1984. So this is a phase one of Pompano research, and out of that came some some basic information, that it's, it's a template, template information, but, but what limited uh, <clears throat> the growth of an industry here was several factors. First of all, the species is not very cold tolerant, so if you, you really can't grow them in ponds, not unless you have a heating system or combine it with a recirculating aquaculture system, systems technology. There was a lot of disease outbreaks, primarily protozoans, uh, parasites such as laminal denium, um, and also the feed conversion was very high, and it still is in some cases, but the marine diets that we had for fin fish back in those, back in those years were, were not formulated uh, to the extent that they should have been for marine fin fish. So there was a lot lacking there. So in the late 90s, there was a renewed interest in this species, and basically it, it came about because of advances in other, other marine fin fish, diet development, hatchery production techniques, different enrichments for live feeds, um, different grow out systems as well. So this, this spurred a, a renewed interest in the species. And a lot of universities and agencies jumped in at this time, late 90s, early 2000s, and uh, actually over the last decades, and supplied a lot of, a lot of uh, information to allow commercialization, commercialization of this species. And I will have a slide a little bit later to show you the the different topics that were primarily researched by these, by these uh, universities and agencies. Along with this, we had some commercial development, and we do have commercial operations right now in existence. Uh, commercial development was largely based in Florida. There was one operation in Mississippi, uh, the Bahamas, uh, Dominican Republic, and also Panama. Currently, there's, there's one juvenile production facility and a breeding facility in Florida producing juvenile pompano. There's one RAS system in Florida that's under development. Uh, it should be producing fish here or getting fish in the water uh, very soon with a targeted production annually of around 125,000 pounds starting out with. And then there's an offshore operation, net pen operation in Panama with a production of around 500,000 pounds a year at this time. So what do we know now? Uh, really, the template for increased commercialization is, is, is in place right now. And there's the three main areas here. We, we know pretty much a lot about reproduction of this species. 
Larva culture and juvenile production are fairly straightforward. I'll briefly go over that here shortly. And then grow out has been proven in RAS and net pen, net pen, uh, ocean net pen cages. So as far as reproduction, it's been accomplished in flow through systems as well as RAS. Uh, broodstock can be acquired from the wild or grown on site. Um, if, you're caught from, if they're caught from the wild, they can be easily quarantined and feed trained. Um, we have consistent and reliable spawning and egg production. And basically you can manipulate photo period here to get them in sync, to get them in where you can have consistent reproduction throughout the year um, using, using a, a modification of the red drum model, at, uh, the red drum uh, cycle that, that Todd was, was mentioning earlier. And then most of the, most of the uh, reproduction is done via induced <coughs> Uh, the, it's induced reproduction, uh, primarily with GNRHA. Um, oocytes are, are sampled from female fish, and, and males are, are checked for, for <coughs> flowing milk. Once uh, the oocytes are, sample, oocytes are sampled, they're measured, and anything above 500, the mean oocyte diameter above 500 microns is suitable for injection with GNRHA. Once they're injected with a pellet, typically uh, the <coughs> fish will spawn. Uh, uh, female male ratio one to one typically they'll spawn in about 36 hours and so if you count the dead, dead eggs I know a lot of researchers don't count the sinking eggs they all count the floating eggs but if you uh, assess the sinking eggs as well it's about a um, fertilization rate around 50 percent of those fertilized eggs the uh, hatching rate is typically around 95 percent so fairly straightforward and, and simple as far as larva culture and juvenile production this has been accomplished in flow through and RAS as well it is fairly straightforward, adapted from other warm pelagics, such as red drum. Um, there's straightforward live feed protocols, typically weaned at least by day 25, if not a lot sooner than that. <laughs> That's on the late end. Um, but there is room to refine. There's always room to refine, right? So, but the, the template is definitely there for mass production juveniles of Pompano. So this is a generalized uh, feeding regime that was developed, that we developed in, at Harbor Branch. Uh, with the USDA project. Start off with green water and enriched rotifers, first feeding around day two to three, then switch them over from enriched uh, rotifers to first instar artemia, followed by second instar enriched artemia, and then couple with microfeeds and then get them on, wean them on microfeeds again by, by day 20, by day 22, if not sooner. So these are just a few shots of larva as they develop, the first feeding larva on the left hand side upper, and then uh, <coughs> one on Artemia, that's a metamorphosed larva, and then we have the metamorphosed, lar metamorphosed juveniles in a tank, and that's, that was a pretty good run there. Typically you can get around 20 to 50 percent survival from a stocked larva to, to juvenile in this species, if it's done, done properly, and probably more with, with new techniques now. Uh, the juveniles typically are, are reared in, until they're stocked into ongoing operations. Uh, they're reared and graded until they're about 100 to 200 grams, then stocked for final grow out. So the, the target grow out ranges anywhere from 0.5 to say 0.9 kilos or so. And grow out is fairly straightforward as well. Uh, again, uh, primary uh, uh, production systems utilized now are ocean cages and, and RAS. They have been uh, grown in low salinity RAS as well, so that's another option for this, this species. Um, uh, producing a pretty, pretty, pretty uh, good survival on this fish once, once the juveniles are stocked. And there, uh, <clears throat> there are some issues that I'll talk about a little bit later with, with, uh, with feeds and also uh, um, early maturation. Uh, the growth curve here is fairly straightforward, pretty fairly rapid growth here reaching uh, <clears throat> this particular graph shows a market size of 700 grams in, in about 275 days or nine months or so. So, so rapid growth here for the, the species to market size. So less than a year to produce a marketable fish. So looking back and talking to a lot of folks involved with the industry and a lot of the, and I failed to mention, I just realized all the co-authors I put on the presentation. So there's, there's about 20 of them or so, and a lot of them are sitting in this room. Anyway, um, as far as research needs, there's several categories. There's, there's four biologic and, and two non-biologic factors. 
here. So first of all, is we need uh, a lot more information as far as broodstock development, captive reproduction, selective breeding, and genetic improvement. We need to look into uh, delayed maturation processes, um, also diet development and refinement for grow out, uh, disease management strategies, economics and business planning, and finally market development and, and expansion. So I'll go through each of these really quickly here. Uh, first of all, I wanted to, I went back and looked, uh, did a literature search and just wanted to see by topic what was the percentage of published works. As, as you could assume or surmise that nutrition was almost 40% here. So a lot of work has been done on nutrition with, with other topics such as uh, genetics and reproduction. There's only 9% of the papers uh, out there focused on this particular topic. So that brings, really we have no long-term, I should say long-term selective breeding programs uh, in place for this species. There's a lot of room for improvement. Uh, past and current breeding has lar largely been reliant on uh, wild-caught animals. I, I wrote this and I said significant improvements are guaranteed. Well, nothing's guaranteed in aquaculture, of course, so probably should scratch that out, but it's likely there could be a lot of uh, improvements with a, with a selective breeding program. Delayed maturation. Um, one of the things we're seeing, or um, talking with Kevin Main about this, is uh, early sex sexual maturation, especially of females, uh, can be a problem. Um, right towards when they're getting towards market size, or develop, they're putting more energy into uh, gamete production. So, uh, possible solutions are again breeding and genetics, manipulation of puberty uh, through different through different means, and also polyploidy might be a solution here. Uh, diet development and refinement for grow out. As with most marine fin fish, the vast majority of studies to date have focused on juvenile fish. Everybody knows that, really, and right. So, basically, that's that's a that's a product or an artifact of of um, universe, the university and agencies not having access to huge tanks or huge grow out systems to test final grow out diets. So, largely focused on juvenile fish. So, we really need to the efforts need to be directed towards larger fish towards grow out, um, and this will be difficult without significant commercial involvement. But uh, especially for RAS systems, as well as, as to, to provide a diet that, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, cloud the tank water and, and, the, and the system, overload the system, but also important for a uh, net pen culture. Disease management, um, you can kind of divide this between RAS and, and offshore culture. Uh, what you're really seeing in, in most RAS systems is or our major concern is bacterial pathogens, uh, mycobacterium, for example. Um, there has been viral outbreaks, the riddle virus with an uh, offshore culture of, of, of Pompano. There, there's a need for vac vaccines and strategies moving forward. Uh, the operation in Panama vaccinates all their fish at about 10 grams uh, by injection, and they've, they've, they've seen good results with that. But we are definitely in the early stages with respect to all these issues. Economics and business planning, there has been some models run, uh, some successful and non-successful operations out there, but this is an ongoing topic that we need to really refine. Uh, typically, as scientists, we and fish people, we think more of the biology all the time. We don't think of the end result. This is what makes the commercial operations money. So uh, it's key to investment. Uh, there, there is a general lack in, of information. There's a need for uh, for uh, supported studies and data, data compila compilation that would uh, support future investment in successful operations. And finally, market development expansion. Um, this is a very popular item uh, in the Gulf Coast, southeast, and up to New England. Well, the sunbird or snowbird population that, is, that has moved to Florida and they go back up there in the summer, they, they would like to have pompano because they, they've experienced it in Florida. However, that's where the market can be expanded uh, towards other, other locales such as Atlanta, Charlotte, non-coastal areas. So uh, the one producer in, in, Pam, uh, in Panama is looking into that. Um, the consumer chef awareness of the product attributes going forward is a, is a key additional operation. Once operations come online with the species, more and more of them do. And I'm not sure if I have time for a question or not, but I don't probably.